So first of all, um, a way to describe the, the company IBM is, I like to say that is the story of computing and its relationship to professionals, to business, and to an institution. And, um, you know, of course, computing as a category has been with us for that long, right? You know, over, over 100 years. But it also has a characteristic that it changes a lot. Mm -hmm. But we are in a very unique moment. I like to say that this is the most exciting time in computing, probably since the 1940s with the advent of the first digital computers, and then what happened a decade later with the inventor of the transistor. And what is happening, what is unfolding, is this combination of bits, neurons, and qubits. And what I mean by that is bits, think about it as the world of high precision computation, embodied by semiconductors and Moore's law and the progress that takes on that front. Neurons as the neural network architectures that are the hallmark of artificial intelligence. And qubits, the world of quantum and quantum computing. And I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to chat about each three, but the most profound thing that perhaps is the most underappreciated element is that what we're gonna witness this decade is the convergence of all three technologies. Is the combination of the power of bringing a trillion transistors in the size of a fingernail, which is the level of integration that's gonna be possible by 2030. The very, very large scale neural networks are the hallmark of foundation models and the advent of fault-tolerant quantum computers also by the end of the decade. So imagine the possibilities when those three technologies intersect, and our purpose, our business model, is about investing heavily in R&D and in ecosystem and collaboration to push, push each one of those frontiers, but also to bring them together with trust and governance in a way that is at the service of our clients and at the service of the institutions that we bring these powerful technologies to in a way that delivers better outcomes. So it's this dual mission of pushing the limits of the technology, but bringing them into the world in a responsible fashion. Mm -hmm. Responsibility is at the heart of the matter, not least, as you say, with the incredible potential of these wonderful technologies. There are risks, but there are also um, great upsides. What does trust mean to IBM? Well, trust is the ultimate license to operate. Uh, if you break trust, uh, you can never be a long-lasting institution. Mm. So for us, it's in our DNA. Uh, and what that means is to make it concrete is trust is the ability, for example, to bring quantum computing to the world, but also to recognize that quantum computers will have a profound impact to how we secure digital information because they will be able to break current encryption mechanisms, which is the ultimate line of defense of the digital modern world. So therefore, you have to devote an equal amount of energy to create quantum safe algorithms and deploy it such that you replace today's cryptography with quantum safe cryptography. Mm. Trust means that in AI, you create incredibly powerful large language models that you can deploy to uh, enhance productivity with customer care, or to automate and improve code writing. Mm -hmm. But it also means that you gotta build a governance around that. So when we launched the Watson X platform last year for generative AI, a hallmark of that was the creation of Watson X dot governance so that one could monitor the entire life cycle from data to the models to the deployment such that if one works in a regulated environment or one works in a context where the AI needs to be auditable and credible on how it was used, that we had a technological solution to that. Mm -hmm. So to me, those are all sort of practical ways in which we bring trust into the world, like trust through technology and trust through our behaviors. Mm -hmm. You work in this ecosystem of the private sector and, of course, closely aligned with governments. Um, to that end, and when it comes to not just cross-sector collaboration, but cross-national, international. How does that work in theory and practice? Well, first off, maybe I'll start with a little bit of a sort of personal dimension of sure. why I care so much about that topic and then give some examples of that intersection. Um, so a number of years ago, I became so convinced and I was so passionate that as these technologies continue to advance, they were gonna have such a profound implication to governments, to the policies uh, that you know, governments undertake, that I decided to get much more involved in that process. And in the context of the United States, 
um, you know, I was lucky enough to be, you know, appointed as, the, as part of the President's Council of Science and Technology Advisors in the White House, and after that, serving on the National Science Board that oversees the National Science Foundation that supports most of the basic research in the United States supporting universities around that. And the idea of that involvement is that none of these technologies that we're talking about, semiconductors, AI, and quantum, are going to be possible to successfully be created, developed, and managed without a new set of partnerships and collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. Mm -hmm. And yet, those institutions, how we do that, are yet to be invented. We have the first sketches of how that can happen, but there's so much work to be done on how we create these collaborations. So I'll give you an example. Within AI, there is a debate about should it be closed or should it be open? We stand very proudly on the defense of open innovation and open science in the world of AI. But it wasn't enough just to say it. You have to act on also what you believe. So we created something called the AI Alliance. Um, we launched it in December. It's actually jointly created uh, between IBM and Meta, and actually over 50 institutions from uh, institutions that we collaborate with the government, like NASA and the National Science Foundation, to world-leading institutions like, you know, EPFL and ETH, you know, and, and uh, Cornell and many others, University of Tokyo around the world, small companies, large companies. In fact, it's grown now to over 80 institutions, and what we defend is that we should collaborate together on some of these topics around trusted AI. How will we evaluate and benchmark AI? How will we create diverse set of foundation models? How should we actually evolve policy to make sure that we not only democratize the access to AI, but like safely govern it? So that is to me an example of how institutions come together mm. in a way that we are bound together by a purpose, by a way of doing things. Mm -hmm believing in the scientific method, believing in exchanging information through open exchange of ideas. So I'm a big fan of the idea of creating institutions that are new. Mm -hmm. um, I remember participating, for example, at the time of the pandemic, co-launching the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortia, right, where we aggregated the world's supercomputers and made them available for free to mm -hmm. all scientists that were trying to study the virus, and treatments for it. Mm. So I think we need a lot more creativity on how different sectors will come together and collaborate in these technologies to guide them towards good outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think it requires that we each think differently, that for us in the private sector, that we incorporate a language of the common good and that we feel comfortable right, going beyond our narrow set of interests and expressing that, and then from the private sector, also recognizing, you know, the economic incentives that can be a catalyst for growth, right, if they get sort of, you know, harnessed properly. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at governments, not least those adopting and integrating AI and next-gen technology into their practices, when it comes to scaling up, what are the challenges there and how do they best overcome them? I think the first thing to recognize is that it's early days. There's no doubt. We've gone through a lot of phases of proof of concepts, mm -hmm. evaluating what is possible, and indeed, the central task of this year is to select and scale yeah. around that. I would say there's a few areas, I mean, it applies to government, but I would say broadly speaking in institutions that are ripe for scaling up. Mm. One is the world of customer care yeah. and citizen care. So the possibilities to deploy assistance that have, of course, extreme dexterity and fluidity with language, but more importantly, to connect it to back-end systems that can facilitate automation and complete mm -hmm. transactions, and, uh, and frankly, a much higher degree of self-service is clearly possible. So every agency that deals with citizens and deals with trying to help them achieve or consume the services that are available, truly the technology is phenomenal in terms of its capability. That is ready for scale up. That's not an experiment anymore. The second area has to do with internal productivity inside agencies. And that has to do, whether it's in the space of IT, 
an automation that you can do to improve the productivity. If we make our internal agencies more efficient, we can invest it more in other core functions, yeah. right, that are higher value add. So everything that has to do with code assistance mm -hmm. and uh, you know, automated programming and so on that applies from cybersecurity to the development of applications. And for example, application modernizations. Often inside our agencies, we have an applications that have not been modernized. Thanks to AI, we have the ability to create um, documentation of those applications and modernize them so that they can run more efficiently and, uh, and with better performance. So those are, you know, additional examples of how we can apply uh, AI broadly. Um, I'm cognizant that uh, the sands of time are running away <laughs> rather quickly. I want to ask you two quick um, final questions, if I may. Um, when it comes to quantum utility, arguably we're there. What about quantum advantage? We're on the path. Are we there yet? And if so, what do we need to be aware of? Well, I mean, quantum computing is another phenomenal technology. It is is one of these areas that, uh, from a difficulty level, I would give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> uh, but we have now reached a point where we have built sufficiently large quantum computers that you can use them for utility, meaning you can actually use it for advancing R&D. So in the previous six, seven years of quantum computers, the people who got to use these systems were people who were fascinated by quantum computers. They were the people who were trying to benchmark them, characterize them, see how they were improving. But now they're good enough that actually you can have chemists and material scientists and biologists and many other scientists that says, I don't care how the quantum computer works, I just wanna use it. I wanna use it to actually get good scientific outcomes. And this is happening this year. We just entered that era of utility. So one important and exciting thing that has happened is that we have been working with governments, both regions and nation states, to set up quantum innovation centers that are designed around what I call the four quadrants. A singular infrastructure, access to state-of-the-art quantum computers, an R&D agenda to continue to advance quantum information science, skill and education so that you create curriculums and certifications to educate the next generation on quantum computing, and fourth, an industrial program. How will the local economy benefit from the use cases of this new form of computation? So now we've created these centers in the United States, in Canada, in Spain, in Germany, in Korea, in Japan, and beyond. So this kind of ecosystem to me is incredibly exciting, mm. right? Because it's now you can touch them, you can feel them, and there's a lot of passion with the next generation and quantum in ways that you could feel a decade ago with AI. Okay, that's exciting. And just to echo what the president of Zimbabwe was saying about his, his hope, his aspiration, his belief in the next generation of uh, captains of industry and uh, leaders of the, the big tech companies, IBM spends a lot of time at campuses around the world. Uh, quantum computing is now very much on the curriculum. Are you inspired by the talent pool? And what are the next gen like? Who are going to be leading this sector forward in the years and decades to come? I, I am incredibly excited. In fact, that's the, the area I'm most excited about because I actually think the most important breakthroughs in quantum computing are not going to be driven by IBM, as good as we are on that topic, <laughs> are going to be driven by that generation, actually by the incredible diversity of scientists who have a passion in their heart about this technology, just like you see the incredible people who are passionate about AI today and they're imagining the future with it. Well, when you go to universities and you see how people are trying to imagine the possibilities of quantum information, nothing less than a revolution on how you actually represent the nature of information and you just see the excitement, the clubs that they form, the use cases that they drive, how they are the ones pushing their professors to change, mm -hmm. right, and adopt these things. To me, that's the biggest source of energy, right? Like, to a big degree, we're doing what we're doing for them, right, because they are the future of, of this field. Sounds like you need to snap them up then at IVM, <laughs> and maybe uh, you we, will. I want them to be wildly successful. <laughs> Some will join us, but uh, other ones will create their own companies or pursue their own research endeavors in different yes. universities. So it's really about you know, um, inspiring them, right? Yeah. And, um, and motivating them to, to take this new technology very seriously. Um, but you know, look, I remind my team all the time and I remind the students, we're so lucky to be living in this moment if you care about technology and computation. I mean, just the sheer amount of change mm. that is happening around, around us is really unprecedented. 
And it's all of these combinations, the, the limits of semiconductors, the limits of AI, the limits of quantum, how they are all going to come together. So if you're a creative person and, um, or you're a risk taker around that, this is the time. This is the time. And that is the note that we shall leave things on. Very inspiring to talk to you. We are lucky. We are privileged to operate in this space. We wish you every continued success thank you. at IBM and to the next generation of leaders in the space. Dr. Daria, thank you very much. Please thank join you. me in thanking you. Thank you, thank you.